obviously the first example was like about the simplest example that I could come up with. Um, let's just pop it on the screen and take a quick look at it. Not really going to compile it or run it because uh, I think you get the idea, but there's a few points that I want to review. And this is where we are using exceptions. We're trapping for exceptions that are thrown by not code that we've written, but code that's in the framework of Java. Let's, let's put it that way. So in this case, we had generated a couple exceptions, um, one of which is when we tried to cast a string as an integer, one which when we tried to do some math on a null object. And both of those are exceptions, and they threw different kinds of exceptions. And this is how we can trap for them. We can wrap the questionable code, and we'll talk about what I mean by questionable in a minute here, but we wrap the questionable code in a try-catch block. And then we can catch. And we can catch either for generally, like an exception is thrown, and I don't really care what kind of exception it was, and we can do something generic, or we can fine-tune our exception ca uh, uh, catching and catch for specific sorts of exceptions. And we can then tailor our response to um, the problem that gets thrown. All right. In this case, all we're really doing is displaying messages, but we can display a more specific message if we catch the specific class cast exception, because we know exactly what happened. We tried to treat something like an integer that wasn't an integer. All right. And again, we also have the text of the exception, the message, which is a property on the exception object. So what happens is, again, if any of, these co uh, any of this code in here creates an exception, uh, it checks to see what kind of exception. The exception itself gets put in a variable called e, and then we can do things with, that, with the properties. Finally, we have a finally clause where we can wrap things up and do something if we need to. All right. So I said we'd put that around questionable code. What do I mean by questionable code? Number one. Um, anytime like a conversion is done, especially if you're not sure that um, the conversion is going to be legit. Remember, for example, in a UI, uh, text boxes that we're going to have are going to be strings. So we may actually put validation to make sure that someone enters a number or someone enters a date, but you know what? What if that validation breaks? Our aim is to make our application as foolproof as possible. So therefore, we want to test, and we want to test our components, and we want our components to handle any eventuality. So we may think, for example, that, yeah, I know this is a string, but I really know I have some validation in the UI that makes sure it's a number. Well, I would still test if I tried to convert a string to a number. I would still put that in a try-catch block. All right. And uh, based on that, I would, I would do something. Maybe, for example, if there's garbage in there, you assume the value is 0. That would be one possible response. All right? So any kind of conversion that you're not absolutely sure of, and let me say you're probably never going to be absolutely sure of, so conversion of data. Any object that could be null, all right? Um, in this case, we sort of deliberately made that object null, but Again, you know, we could have something, um, we could have a case of something where an object didn't get initialized, it got passed to a function. The compiler can't catch that, all right? Um, therefore, we would test to see if the, uh, we, would, we would test uh, if the um, object was null and throw an exception, um, if it was going to lead to a problem later on. So, again, Checking to see if an object is null is, is a likely thing that you might check and you might wrap in a try-catch. Um, we don't have an example of this here, but you can imagine anything that connects to something outside of your own application. 
something that's outside of your control. Uh, probably the most notable example of this would be if you used a, 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 a database server. If you're connecting to a database server and you're doing something. The database server is sort of outside of the control of the application. That's a, sort of an independent entity that runs on its own. And it could be down. All right, it could, database server could be crashed. Or you could use a web service to pull data up. So again, something that's outside of the control of your application. All right. Anytime you do that, you probably want to wrap it in a try-catch because, again, you can't rely on those things working the way that you would think they would or that you would hope them to. There's liable to be issues with them, and issues with them, you don't want to cause your application to blow up. Um, one of the things that I said way back, I think, in the early part of the class, I mentioned it in all my classes, I'm pretty sure I mentioned it in this class, is one of the things that makes code better or worse is how maintainable it is and how reusable it is and how we can easily change it to do other things. And that's true, and a lot of the things that we talk about uh, relates to that. But just as true is how um, fault tolerant it is. In other words, when something bad happens, does everything just come crumbling down? All right. If that's the case, then now your application probably isn't real good. All right. Um, not that your application can go out and fix a broken database if the database is down. That's not what we're talking about. But if the database is down, the application shouldn't blow up with some incomprehensible error and, and so on. Um, if this was an example of a web application, you would want to display a message that users would understand and tell them what they need to do. All right? That's sort of generally, regardless if it's a web application or, or not. Uh, and again, I say this in web application because you can use Java code inside a web application. And I'm not referring to JavaScript. I'm talking about full-blown Java code. But um, what, would, what constitutes a good error message? When you give the user an idea of what happened, and give them an idea of what they need to do, what their next step is, what they need to do is correct, uh, to correct the issue. Not that they're going to go and, and correct it, but like let's say, for example, they tried to register for a website and the database is down. They go to save their, their uh, information and create a new user, and the database is down and the update blew up. You could say something like, you know, user was not created to let them know, hey, they, they have not yet registered on the site. Um, you know, probable cause, database issue, uh, your next step would be to try again in a few hours or something like that. Or call and then give someone's number, all right, or an email address or whatever. Now, in the meantime, you would probably log that to some sort of log file so that you could see, and oh, yeah, the database is down and correct it. But um, as far as from the user's viewpoint, you would want to say things along those lines. Really, and that's where testing for the specific exception comes in. All right? um, we can test for just general things. If something goes wrong, we can, we can at least gracefully tell the user that something went wrong and maybe give some information about that. But if you test for the specific errors, you can then take specific actions. Any question about this example, what we went over last time? You're never going to see one this easy again, <laughs> all right? So most of them, why do most of them get more complicated? Well, there's only one thing going on in this. I just have exactly one function. So the errors are created and handled right here. More common is where the errors happen in one place and get handled somewhere else. If you think, for example, in the case of a GUI, I may go and enter some data in and try to do some operation, my class might throw an exception, but the GUI needs to handle it. That is, display the error message and tell the user to correct something or whatever. So usually it's two classes communicating and passing exceptions. One throws the exception and the other catches it. So again, we don't have any code in here to throw the exception. That code exists within the... Um, the, the, the Java framework classes. In fact, that, that, um, that code would really be part of um, the signature of a function if there was a function involved, that it could potentially cause this, um, um, this, this issue, this exception. All right, let's look at another example.
And I'm going to turn the screen off because I'm going to make some changes here. This is more of a uh, less of a Java framework issue and more of like a business issue where there would be exceptions. going to get rid of any exception handling or exception throwing from this guy. Just bear with me for one second. All right, what this is, is this is a little um, snippet of an application. I have a test application. And, uh, or a test uh, class, and I have a, a class that handles driver's tests and driver's permits. This is a, um, this is a uh, example that, like, where the class determines if the person should get their temporary permit or not. All right. What's the rules for getting a temporary permit? And it's funny. I, I can almost go back to when I first did th these examples in class. All right, because a lot of times the examples in the class relate to something that was happening in my lifetime. So uh, I probably first wrote this example when my youngest daughter was going for their temporary permit because it was on my mind. It's like, well, what could I do? It's like, well, I know. She went for a temporary permit. Yeah, let's figure that out. So anyhow, so I have Okay, uh, I'm going to let that go because I have duplicate classes. That isn't a real, real error. I made a copy of the class and it's complaining about that. I just want to make sure these classes compile Java permit, driver permit, and tester. Okay. Okay. Let me go and pull those out. Okay, clean compile. Okay, let's try this now. 
Okay, tells me this person is not eligible. I have a one test case. Okay. Let's look at the code. There's a test code. There's a test code. And here is the class that does the testing. All right, right now there's no exception processing in this. I wanted to show you the example prior to the exception processing. That's where my confusion came in at the beginning. So the test code simply creates a driver's permit object and asks if that driver is eligible, saying the age is negative 16. True, they had an eye test, and their score on the test was 178. Well, obviously that's bogus because people aren't negative 16 years old, and the score is supposed to be 0 to 100. All right? Yet, there's no validation for it, so it went and processed it. It went and processed it, and it looked to see if there was an eye test done, and if the age is greater than or equal to 15 and a half, and if the score on the test is greater than 75. Well, obviously that's a problem because it's invalid data, and yet it told them that uh, the person was in ineligible. All right, when probably they're 16 and they got a 78, right? So it went and told them that they were not eligible. Uh, let's think of another example. Let's say that they're 116. Well, the same thing would apply. I was going to do 116 with a grade of 178. But it would also tell them, uh, well, no, it would tell them in this case, let's do this. This is what I wanted to do. Let's say they're 114, and their grade on the test was 163 or 165. tells them they're eligible, even though those numbers are, are goofy. And in fact, it might be that someone just typoed, and it was supposed to be that they're 14 years old and their grade was 65, and yet it told them that they're eligible to get a temp. Um, what we really want to do is we want to simply say, hey, there's a problem here if any of the numbers are outside the parameters. All right? So what we want to do is we want to Throw an exception if it's outside the parameter. And we have two choices of who's going to handle the exception. It's pretty obvious what the two choices are, right? Because we only have two classes. We can either handle it in this case, or we can handle it in this case. Remembering that the tester is sort of our substitute for the UI. So let's imagine if you were the head of the Drivers Bureau and someone had data that was way outside of the range, what would you want to have happen? You have two possibilities. One is you could simply turn them down if the data is bad. Because it's probably better not to give someone a permit that should have one than give someone a permit that shouldn't have one. right? And the only reason I say that is if you deny someone a permit and they're supposed to get one, they're going to bring it to your attention. Whereas if someone slipped by and they were 16 and they scored a 46 on, the, on, the, on the, the test, but the data entry person entered it wrong, and they entered in 146 or something like that, they're not going to say, wait a minute, I don't deserve this driver's permit. All right? So it's probably better in that case to err inside, on the on side of caution. So one thing you could do is you could, if the data comes in bad, you could reject it. You could say, nope, it's not valid. And then let the person come and straighten it out if there was a mistake. The other thing you could do is not do anything, not say it was valid or invalid, and simply put a message back to the UI that would say, hey, there's a problem with that data. I'm not going to accept or decline this, this driver's uh, uh, application. You have to fix it and then resubmit it. So that's sort of your two choices. And how you were doing it would sort of depend on how the application was written. 
Uh, back in the old days, they had a lot of uh, processes that were called batch processes, all right, where you'd gather up a group of data for like a day's worth, and then you'd process it all at once, or maybe an hour's worth, or whatever. But you'd group a bunch of transactions together, and you'd process them all at once. All right, that was called a batch job. Well, if this was done in a batch job, then maybe I would reject and let the person tell me and come and complain. If this is more of a real-time situation where you're typing, where you have a user entry person typing in the values, boom, I might pop up an error message on their screen. So a lot would have to do with the process. A lot would have to do with the consequences of what if I, let, what if I return a true when it should be a false or vice versa. So you really have to consider the problem. There's no cookie cutter solution on how to do this. Um, an example of something that may still be a batch job is maybe a bank processes all their credit applications together for a day or something like that. I know a lot of credit applications, uh, some places they, they process them immediately. But some places, some larger banks might process them like once a day or whatever. Okay. So we're going to start throwing some exceptions here. These are going to be exceptions that we throw and we catch. Because we're not violating the rules of Java. We're not doing like an illegal conversion, or we're not doing a null object or anything like that. We are simply uh, violating things that violate our business rules. All right? So what I could do is I could do something like this. The first case I'm going to do, I'm going to write the code that will throw the exception and catch it all within the driver permit class. OK? So I'm going to go and do this, try. I'm going to try these statements. And I'm just going to do the simplest thing here, and I'm going to catch Any old exception called E. And I'm going to put validation in. I'm going to say if arg age is less than zero, it can't be negative years old, or arg age is greater than 115, or some ridiculously high number. It's doubtful anyone 115 is going to be applying for a learner's permit. Suppose it's possible, but we're going to assume for now that, that we wouldn't have that. Then I want to throw an exception. And let me just look real quick at the syntax of that. I think it's throw, yeah. I did not want that. So I'm going to say throw new exception. And I'm going to put in parentheses a message. Because the exception object has several constructors, one of which uh, accepts a message. And this message will be, you know, problem with age. All right, and I'm going to do the same thing with the score. So how does this work? So try catch just like we had before, except we have written the conditions that constitute an exception. So if these two things happen, one of these two things happen, 
we're going to throw a new exception, which means that the execution of this halts, and we go to the catch block and do whatever it is we need to do. If that is, if it's, none of these things are true, if this, we then look at evaluate this if statement. If one of these conditions is true, we throw another exception. And again, the catch will catch it. Otherwise, we get to this statement and do the actual validation. And then finally, we return the results. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that um, if there's an exception, I'm going to turn down the person. All right, that's the rule that I'm going to make. So I'm going to say B results equals false. All right, until we get this straightened out, you're not getting your license. We're not improving it. All right, and then again, it would be up to them to come, which they would be motivated to do. So let's save this and compile it and see how this works. Tells me that they're not eligible. Why? What happened? Well, our test class set this up with these outlandish numbers in for the age and for the score. We got here. We're in the try block. Actually, each of these was hit, all right? Uh, but the first exception sort of takes precedence over the second exception. So if we were to print out, or maybe print, or maybe write to a log file, I'm using printouts because that is uh, that's easier to show. All right. But we could output it to a sequential file. A lot of times these logs are simply sequential files. In fact, if you ever look on your system, your operating system, whether you have a Mac or a PC, if there's some kind of problem and it says, like, check the system log for details, typically it's just going to be a plain old sequential file. All right? You're not going to update, like, a database with your errors. All right? Why not? Well, what if the problem's with the database? How do you update the database with an error? Whereas writing to just a plain old simple sequential file that's just a plain old text file is real easy. If your computer can't handle that, then you've got big problems. All right? So we could output this, or we could send the information to somewhere else. Um, but I'm just going to display it in this case. Realistically, if this was like a batch process, I probably wouldn't display it to the screen because there wouldn't be anyone like looking at the screen. This would all be running sort of uh, in the computer. Uh, I would, again, send it to a file. But for our purposes, we'll display it on the screen. All right, so compile, test, and it says is not eligible. What did I do? I forgot to save it. There we go. Problem with score, not eligible. Interesting. It did both of them. Did, uh, the second one took precedence. It threw the exception, but it didn't stop executing. All right. That kind of surprises me, but oh well. I guess I've been surprised before. All right. So this is how we could do it, where this object both throws and catches the exception. And if you can do that, that's fine. Um, trying to think of a, a, um, a, um, a, a another realistic example of this. Um, I guess if you got outlandish data, you could assume a default all right, value. That could be dangerous, I suppose, if the, if the default value wasn't accurate. But I suppose you could do that. All right. Um, 
But anyhow, um, in this case, we're assuming a default of if it doesn't validate, then we're going to decline the application. All right, more fun is when we have our business class throw the exception and our user interface class catch it. I would say that is probably more common, especially if you're talking about online things, things that, um, uh, that work in real time. In other words, people enter the information in and boom, they have an answer immediately, as opposed to something that like, got batched up and got run as a group in the middle of the night when there's no one there. Okay, we're going to keep the throw, but we're going to move the catch. All right, so this code will not be in a try catch. We're going to have these here, and if, and we're going to add to the signature of the function that this throws exceptions. So that now is, is the final piece of the function signature. All right? The, whether it's public, private, or protected is part of the signature. The return value is another one. The name of the function is another one. The number and the types of the arguments is, a, is another thing. And the final thing is whether or not it throws an exception. And if it throws an exception, what kind of exception does it throw? So now I'm going to move the try catch to this block of code, which again is representing our UI, right? Because this is our unit test, this represents the user interface. When we start talking about user interfaces, which might be today, or it might be next week, all right, um, then this would be our user interface. But until then, um, our unit test classes hold the place of an interface. So I'm going to do this. If, or I'm sorry, try. Catch exception E and then I'm going to output Data not valid must be corrected. And again, in this case, I'm simply out dumping that out. In the case of an application with a GUI, we might go and we might put this in a label on our page. All right. Then I'm going to add to that e dot get message. So we can see the actual text of the error message, the exception message. Let me look. Looks correct. Excuse me. Data not valid, must be corrected, problem with score. I do find it interesting that it's throwing the second one, unless I've changed my test data. Oh, huh. I'm checking for 115 and I put in 114. That's why it's getting the second one. There we go, let's go crazy and say 116. Now it will get, now the first one will apply. I was surprised, it's like, that is not my understanding of how Java is supposed to work. It should be the first exception, boom, you're out of there. And yeah, it is, I just wrote the code goofy. Now it will say, problem with age. 
And if I had had it change before, it would have said problem with age before as well. OK, so now all of a sudden everything is clear for me. All right. Yes. Yes. Uh, in other words, what you're saying, let me see if I'm understanding you right. You're absolutely right. This is a pain in the neck. Let's say I go and correct that. This is me typing in the right values in the GUI. You have to use your imagination. And all of a sudden, boom, problem with score. Sure. Yeah, it's probably both of yeah to that. give both of those errors at the same time. That's actually a tough question. Because the answer is, with exceptions, no. That's not how exceptions work. I could, here's what my options are, all right? Here's what my options are. Option one. This is a tough question, all right? Option one, I could leave it like it is and tough, <laughs> all right? I'm not, not a completely satisfying option, but it is an option. Option two, I could leave the classes the way they are to handle exceptions and then write validation in my GUI that would validate and display all the error messages prior to going and calling the method on the function. OK, does that make sense? In other words, you hit the button to save this or to, 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 to process this application. All right. Eventually, it's going to create this class and call this method and get the exception. But we could put redundant validation in it, in the GUI, that would look for all the possible errors and tell you, boom, you have a problem, all right? And not, not just you have a problem, you have these problems, and it would show you all of them, all right? That's sort of like, you know, you see these old guys sometimes that wear a belt and wear suspenders, right? You got a redundant check in there, all right? If one of them goes wrong, at least you got the other one. So if there happened to be a bug in the GUI validation, at least, the class would not let bad data go by because it has validation in it as well. Um, that would probably be the method I would do. I would probably keep that, I'd probably keep the classes the way it is and write validation on the GUI. Other things that you could do, there's a school of thought that says never write any validations in your GUI because that's a business rule. Throw exceptions instead. Let the class tell you if there's something wrong. In which case, I could rewrite my exceptions to look for all the problems in one giant if statement. And if any of them were true, I could then construct through if statements this message more involved. I'm going to copy this code because I don't actually want to do it, but I want to start doing it. Excuse me. So I could do something like this. If any of these things are true, I could throw an exception. But my message is going to be this. And I could do this then, if our gauge is less than zero, 
I could say air equals air plus age too low. Age too low. Otherwise, if age is greater than 100, age too high. Otherwise, if score is less than zero, score too low, Otherwise, if score is greater than 100, score too high. And then I would create the exception and throw in, use the error string to do that. So you see what I did? I looked for all the possible errors in one if statement. If any of them are true, then I form an error message. And I form the error message by concatenating on every problem that exists. All right? So if the age was too low and the score was too low, I would start take my empty string, add to it the verbiage for age too low. OK, this wouldn't be true. If the score was also too low, I would add to what was in the message before a message that says score too low. So in that way, my message coming back would contain a description of all the errors instead of just one of the errors. So that would be an option as well. All right. That's actually not a bad option to do either. All right. Especially, especially if I'm going to handle the age too low and the score too low the same way. All right. Because I'm throwing just an exception. I'm not specifying specifically what kind of exception occurred. All right, questions about this? Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to try this. What the heck? You got the idea. We display both those messages. A uh, great question. Um, keep in mind again, me talking about adding things to the GUI doesn't mean you skip on validation in the class itself. All right? Because remember, the GUI is potentially one of many possible ways that we could create these objects is from a GUI. We could create them from another way as well. All right? The GUI being just one way. Uh, so the GUI is just one way that we could create it. So when I say add validation of the GUI, that doesn't allow us to say no validation in the object. All right? Um, because we could potentially, when we create these components, we create them to be used anyway. When we release them out in the world, we don't know how they're going to be used in the future. So therefore, you want to make your component as fault tolerant as possible, as ironclad. So don't think in terms of like, well, I'm going to do this in the GUI and I'm going to do this in the, it's like, make your class as ironclad as possible, then maybe you can write your GUI to work with it, but knowing that it could be used in other ways. It's really a challenge, I, I have to say. All right. So here's where we throw an exception and we let someone else handle it. And that is probably, to be honest, more typical. Because again, usually these things are going to happen from a GUI, uh, going to be triggered by a GUI. We're going to display, if there's anything we can do, we're going to display a message to the operator to tell them that they have to do something. All right, I wrote another version of these classes, though. And that's what we're going to look at now. 
Because no matter what problem we had, we were always throwing just a plain old exception. What I actually did, believe me, is overkill. As I created a different exception class, all right, for every kind of exception that could exist. All right? In fact, I even created an inheritance structure, which is definitely overkill. You can, uh, exceptions are classes just like anything else. And you can create subclasses and superclasses. So I create, I created a driver's permit exception class. I created a subclass for that, which is a driver's permit age exception. I created a subclass for that, a driver's permit age too low exception. And finally, I created a driver's permit score exception. Why did I do that? I did that because this is an example, right? We show the capabilities and we show the things that we can do, all right? Keep in mind that what I did, and I had it throwing an exception, that would make every problem throw the same exception. This allows us to fine tune our exception handling. This would be especially valuable if we wanted to do different things depending on the kind of exception. So this allows us to do different things based on whether it's a driver's permit exception. Maybe we handle age exceptions a different way. Maybe it's to, dis maybe, it's to, to maybe we put very specific instructions on the, on the screen that if you put in an age that's wrong, you ask the person for their birth certificate again. So maybe we would want to display in the GUI, there's an age exception, verify uh, uh, applicant's birth certificate, for example. We might do that for an age exception, but not for a score exception. We can only do that if we can differentiate between those two different kinds of exceptions. And that's what I'm doing here. So I've created all these exceptions. There's not a lot of code in them. Whoops. But the driver's, permit a, the driver's permit exception class really simply extends ex exception and it has a constructor to pass the argument up. There could be other attributes in here too. All right. The age exception. Again, doesn't really do anything. Yeah. All we have is we pass the argument up. The age too low exception doesn't do anything as well. All right. I want to show you how this works, and then we'll review it in more detail next time. Let's look at the driver's permit class real quick. And let's look at the tester class. All right. Our function now throws one of two exceptions. A driver's permit 
age too low exception or a driver's permit score exception. I guess I forgot about if the score is too low or the score or the age is too high. Figuring, hey, if the 115 year old person wants to get a learner's permit, more power to them. And figuring that maybe someone got a score less than 100 because they spelled their, or less than zero because they spelled their name wrong or something and the, the person took off extra points or something like that. So I now identify the different exceptions that can be thrown by this. And then I throw specific exceptions depending on the specific problem. Correspondingly then, I have specific catches to catch the exceptions that get thrown. So all I've done is I've fine-tuned it. Instead of just throwing a generic exception, I throw specific exceptions depending on the specific problem, and then I can catch those specific exceptions. All right. We'll pick up and review this in more detail, because I don't think I've covered it as, as in-depth as I want to. But um, it's pretty straightforward once you have the basic idea down. This is just really fine-tuning our coding. All right, that's all I had. I will go upstairs and uh, we'll go to lab. All right.